Jarvis, thank you so much for joining me. I, I've always looked forward to our conversations. You're so articulate. You have some really, really good ideas. And, and especially right now, I can't wait to get into it. So thank you for joining us once again, man. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. So let's let's get into it right quick. So yesterday, th there was a, a lot of heavy news. And I just want to get your overall impressions and your overall reaction to what happened yesterday with Breonna Taylor. First and foremost, I'm not surprised um, that, you know, justice wasn't served. Um, am I outraged by it? Absolutely. It, 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 it never ceased to amaze me how the justice system um, finds a way to ensure that uh, Black Americans don't get justice and, you know, and, and it, it's just disheartening, you know, like, like I said, I'm not surprised by it, but, you know, I was definitely hopeful that somehow, some way, this would be the one where we, you know, that maybe just the, the pressure that's been on everybody since this has happened, you would think with all the media coverage, with all the, the social media posts, with everything that's going on, just the pressure of the people would just force them to just say, you know what, let's sacrifice this guy, you know, but instead, what do we get? We got the family got $12 million, which I think is great. I think, you know, I think money is, is, is important, but it's not everything because while that family is, is going to be taken care of, Black America is still not taken care of, right? We still don't feel um, that we'll get justice in these situations because history has shown us that there won't be justice. Um, it, 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 you know, I don't want to say I'm, I'm numb to it because I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm angry, but at the same time, like, I still feel this, this numbness just that, like, man, like, it's, it's just never going to change. Um, I, it, it, it was, it was, I went through a wide range of emotions yesterday, just really just going, I actually woke up to the news. I was, um, I took a nap because I'm, you know, got a newborn, so you got to get sleep when you can, and and I woke up to, you know, CNN and text messages from friends and family telling me, you know, what happened. And I'm, of course, I look into it more. And I'm, the first thing I saw was the, the Wenton endangerment or whatever it was. And I'm like, okay, I, I didn't know what it was, as I'm sure most people didn't right away know what it was. But right away, I knew it was some BS. I knew it was something, some sort of loophole, some sort of something to, I, I and because if it's anything other than this person being charged with murder, manslaughter, you know, some sort of degree murder, like it, like we're reaching, like we're just pulling something out. And to know that her murder came second to gunshots in a wall, like that, that's, that is just not cool. You know, um, as you know, as a black man, like I'm already afraid uh, to get pulled over. I'm afraid of, of those situations. And just to know that no justice continues to happen heightens that anxiety, heightens that fear that I have of those that are supposed to serve and protect. A couple months ago, I got pulled over. I wasn't speeding. I wasn't, uh, I, I was using my turn signal. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. And I noticed a police officer was following me, had my pregnant wife in the car with me. We had just went to Home Depot. We were trying to make it back home. We were working on a project in my son's nursery and we just needed a couple of things and we're just trying to get back home. And I noticed the guy's following me, the cops following me. And I tell my wife, I said, he's following me. And she's like, no, give him. I said, he's, I, I knew right away he was following me. And um, eventually he pulls me over. Uh, we pull over into like this gas station parking lot. And when I tell you I'm trembling, because think about it, in my mind, I haven't done anything wrong. If I had been speeding, Hey, I, I get it. You're going to give me a speeding ticket. Cool. I was in the wrong. But in your mind, when like, I haven't done anything wrong, like every time I turned, I used a signal. And what happened was how I confirmed that he was following me when I made this U-turn. When I made the U-turn, I'm like, yep, he's following me. And that was scary. Um, and I'm literally trembling. Like I'm a six foot four black guy. Like not a whole lot of things frightened me, but I was trembling like, and I uncontrollably, like, I, I'm like, and in my mind, I'm like, what do I do? Like, how do I, he's going to probably ask for my driver's like, how do I reach for this stuff 
without him thinking I'm reaching for a gun or I'm reaching for something to attack him. And in that moment, all I'm thinking, and it's not even so much my safety that and my sanity that was was that I was worried about. It's like my pregnant wife is in the car. And, and I'm just thinking about, am I Philando Castillo right now? Like, because that's the same thing that pretty much happened to him. And and those moments just 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 frighten you. The now to to round up the story, when the officer got to my vehicle, he was trembling too. He was almost trembling too when he realized he pulled over a black man <laughs> because it was almost like he was like, crap. <laughs> it was like awkward for him too. So right away, he kind of came at a very, like an angle, like he was still protecting himself, making sure in case I was reaching for something. But he right away told me, you're not in trouble. I'm not giving you a ticket. I'm not doing this. You, But you could just tell like it, it, it was it took everything in him to make sure that I didn't walk away from that situation feeling like, you know, uh, I was targeted. Yeah. And he ended up, he pulled me over because I had, uh, so I have a vehicle that has uh, obviously a right uh, tail light, a left tail light. And then I also have the one in the middle of like my back windshield. Uh -huh. um, that one was out. That's why he pulled me over, which is still kind of, suspect whatever yeah but it, it, it was okay that made sense at least it made sense um and but what's disheartening about that is like i don't think that's the experience that white americans have when they get pulled over and that's not that's just not right like how is that equality you know how you know no matter what happened in the scenario just the fact that when i get pulled over i'm like shaking is not right yeah. You know, it, it, I shouldn't feel that way. You know, when white Americans get pulled over, they get to talk back to the police officers if they want to. They get to, you know, have that encounter and they, they go about their day. When I get pulled over, I don't know if I'm going to get accused of stealing my own car. I don't know if, you know, like, I don't know. And those things are are, are just not cool. And so yeah. when you see something like the Breonna Taylor uh, situation, where she was killed inside of her own apartment and the guy gets off scot-free. Not, I mean, I guess he got the, the, the charge or whatever, but he's out on his little $15,000 bond. Like he's out. Like uh, the, the white America's going to get him out of jail every single time with those little bitty bonds. Right. Um, but he's basically walking around free. Right. And he killed an innocent black woman. <sighs> You know, so it's just like, where do we go from here? And, you know, as much as we talk about the issues, I think it's important that we start looking for solutions because obviously the solutions aren't going to come from the powers that be right now. So, you know, it, for me, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out different ways, different solutions that we can do to, to lessen those encounters that we have with police officers, um, because the less encounters we have, the more opportunities um, the less opportunities they'll have to do something to us. So whether that means um, educating our people more on on their rights and and making sure you're doing the right thing and and just limiting the, the encounters that you possibly have. So somehow we've got to do that. We've got to figure out how to limit our encounters and our interactions with police officers because that's the only way um, that I see any change happening anytime soon. I love your attitude, man. That I commend you for for that uh, mind frame because I, I know that it's very intentional. I think it's it's really easy to give into all the feelings that you talked about having, and then go down a, a very destructive uh, path. But you know, kind of what we've discussed in the past, you know, it, it's not getting stuck in that uh, bad place where there's no real growth happening. You know, uh, there's value in acknowledging that. Uh, but you need to move on. So I, I love the solutions. Uh, I, I also really, I'm surprised by your story because it sounds like both of you kind of had that moment of humanity where you kind of saw each other, recognized the situation, and then kind of helped each other through it. Uh, have you had a chance to reflect on, on that part of it? I have. Um, you know, even after the encounter was over, um, my wife and I were actually headed to uh, have some breakfast. Um, at a little diner uh, across the way. And um, literally I'm sitting in the parking lot, I'm still trembling from, even though the situation went okay, 
like I'm still trembling. Yeah. And so we we go inside and and, and we talk about it. We we literally unpack the whole situation. Um, I told her everything that I witnessed, I noticed from the beginning of the whole situation. It's a couple of things that she didn't even notice. And then, you know, she brought it back to, but did you notice how afraid he was to approach you? Did you notice how he, you know, and it, it, it brought it full circle to where I wasn't angry at him. I wasn't, you know, I didn't hold any ill will because he didn't, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. Like he, um, he was probably bored. It was a Sunday morning. He was probably a little bored trying to get a couple of stops in. And <laughs> out. There, there was literally no traffic out, you know, so like, hey, he had to, you know, so I get it. Like he has to do his job. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we did reflect on it. Um, you know, I, we handled the situation as best we could. Um, I, I was, t- you know, my wife was taken, you know, she she was taken aback by how terrified I was. And I think it it opened her eyes to like, wow, this is, you know, nothing went down, but like, this is, this is serious, you know? Um, And I know she, she already knows that, but like witnessing it firsthand, like she was in the vehicle with me and she was actually glad she was in the vehicle with me. Although I wasn't because my thing was, (laughs) if something happens to me, something happens to me, but she shouldn't have to witness it. And I would hate for that story to reach my son (laughs) that hey you know we were doing this and and you know your dad got pulled over and this happened yeah you know and uh so that was that was how it was i mean you know you always you know i'm always hopeful for the best possible outcome but at the end of the day like you can't help but think of the worst possible outcome because we've seen the worst possible outcome unfold in several instances I remember back in um, 2016 when the Philando Castile and the uh, Alton Sterling incidents happened. Um, you know, it was the first time, you know, that we kind of gotten an uproar since Trayvon Martin and some other instances, right? Um, but I remember I went to my niece's basketball game and it was in, um, let's just face it, it was in a, a white Trump kind of area. Um, and I, I was leaving, I was leaving the game um, by myself. I went to the game by myself. My wife was actually working. I went to the game by myself to support her and I'm going home and stubbornly, I didn't put um, my address in the GPS thinking I knew exactly how to get back home from the school. And I made a long, a wrong turn and I'm on this, this two, two lane road and no man's land. Like I said, it's Trump County over there. And I'm driving, I'm driving, I'm driving. And then there was a car behind me. <laughs> Again, I can't see, there's no lights. There's no, you know, there's no street lights or anything. So it's just, I'm just going by my, my lights on my car to be able to see. And then I see these, this, these uh, a car behind me, the lights behind me. And I, that was, it took me back to that. That was that same kind of moment I had, like I had two months ago where I was scared for my life <laughs> because I didn't know if it was a police officer, if they were following me, because again, I'm on high alert because just a few days ago, I witnessed back to back deaths by police officers. And then a couple of days after that, police officers got killed in Dallas. So there was a lot of turmoil going on. So I was afraid for my life because like, I know this is not my neck of the woods. <laughs> and I know the police officers out here probably don't like my kind too much. Um, so it took me back to that. But, you know, it's just always been that constant hamster wheel of, of emotions. And, and I just do my best to try to, like I spoke earlier, I try to keep my, I try to stay away from police situations as much as I can. I try to go to speed limit. I try to watch out. <laughs> I know where the speed traps are. Like I, I I don't want any problems. I don't want to put myself in that position because when you do things to put yourself in position to have encounters with police officers, sometimes those encounters aren't too favorable for you. So yeah. um, a simple traffic stop can turn into um, manslaughter. It's, it's, yeah. it's just reality. Yeah. Okay, so you know when when I contacted you to to participate in this, you know the the title of the series is is Grace, right? Um, and after what happened yesterday, I really had to sit with 
with all of this and at some point try to really think of what that meant for this conversation because in, in my mind you know grace is is really something that you you have within you that you choose to give but like we've discussed in the past you know there there's times where it's it's not so easily reached right uh, so I'm curious uh, what role does grace play in in situations like what we saw yesterday with Breonna Taylor great question um I'm gonna take it here so last night um we got alerts on our phones that a couple of police officers were shot um during protests um uh, in Breonna Taylor's hometown and again I kind of have that no justice no peace kind of numbness in me to where I'm like it didn't I wasn't like, oh my God, at first. And, and I want to frame this in the right way because I, I, in no way do I believe that innocent police officers deserve to be shot because of actions of a, of a bad seat. I, I don't. I have a really close friend who's, who's like a brother to me that's a police officer and I would be devastated if something like that happened to him. I'm, I'm afraid for his life as an officer and as a Black man. So I totally that's not the message I'm sending. Um, but th the message I'm trying to send is it's difficult to have grace in those periods where there's no justice on the other side. And it's difficult to have grace when you don't feel that others have grace for our circumstances, right? So um, for instance, you see this segment of society that is all lives matter, blue lives matter, um, you know, Trump support Magna wearing hats, and this is not a mag manga hat. This is a Make America Arrest the Killers of Breonna Taylor hat. Um, you have those people, the people that don't want to wear masks, and you have those people that they have their narrative that they spin, and they're constantly posting a bunch of baloney. Um, and again, their biggest thing is it's not Black Lives Matter; it's all lives matter. And but yet, you don't ever see them come to the defense of Breonna Taylor. You never see them come to the defense of George Floyd. And these people were killed. They were unarmed and killed at the hands of police officers. Now, you, you flip it and a couple months ago or a month ago, um, the young white boy was shot um, by the black man. And all of a sudden he became the poster, poster boy for All Lives Matter. And it almost felt so, it, it felt so disingenuous. It was almost like they were waiting, that segment of the population was waiting for something to happen so that they could spin their narrative and say, see, see, this is what happened. And first of all, that little boy was killed by a thug. Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, they were killed by law enforcement officers. Huge difference, <laughs> huge, huge difference. These are the people that are supposed to serve and protect. Um, we also had the situation with Rayshard Brooks, they could have done something different with Rayshard Brooks. He was at the Wendy's drive through and they um, were messing with him and they said they thought he pulled a taser out and then they shot him as he ran away and this, that, and the third. He tried to get away. He was like, officer, I'll do whatever. He, he let them know he was drunk. Instead of serving and protecting him, what did they do? They shot him too. They could have very easily figured out some resources. Hey, where do you live? Hey, let's make sure he gets home safely. We have his vehicle. We can we can deal with him later. Or even if he's running away, they have his vehicle. Like deal with him later. But it's never that way with black men. It's always the the worst case scenario. So when I say that, it's 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 difficult to have grace when you don't feel that grace is being extended your way and that it's not a two way street. And I also feel that I feel that black people are a graceful people. And and overall. Like Black people are not. No, are. I, I feel are. like we have grace. I think we we're a lot more uh, graceful than as than people uh, project uh, or try to portray us to be. Um, you know, we we we're quick to we we were inclusive uh, at the protest, man. All the the so many black people were embracing the police chief and like we're like we should be mad at the police. But no, we embraced him when he was speaking, and 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 you know I, I feel like they would have been, 
had every right to boo anybody that was wearing a badge. <laughs> but instead, they were cheering him. They were shaking his hand. They were they were embracing him. So like the the people who were causing ruckus weren't necessarily at those protests weren't necessarily black people. Those were people that were planted to make the protests look like they're more violent than what they are. Um, and, and those are the things that make you not want to have grace when you know things are happening purposely to make you look bad to, to, and it's like, how do you have grace for that? Now, at the same time, um, everybody should be extended grace. You know, if you have any sort of faith that you believe in, any higher power that you believe in, you know that grace has been extended to you. You know that a, a lot of things have been extended to you that you don't deserve. And, and nobody is really worthy of grace, but we get it anyway, right? But at the end of the day, like, it, it, we're human. <laughs> yeah. And it's only so much you can tolerate. I mean, it, you know, if, if you got a bully that's picking on you constantly at school, this bully's constantly picking on you, <laughs> you, you might have grace a couple of times, like, all right, I'm gonna let him make it, I'm gonna let him make it. But one day you're gonna snap. And you're going to punch that bully. You're going to just take your shot <laughs> because yeah. that bully has picked at you long enough to where it's like, so it, I, I think it's to that point to where, you know, it's been 400 years of getting bullied for uh, African-Americans in this country. And I think we're to the point where we we're fed up. <laughs> and, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we should go around and be, grace should be extended to those who deserve grace, who are, who are extending grace. But to those who are, who are just blatantly or overtly being racist, or even those those ones that aren't overtly being racist, because those are the worst ones, those ones that are silent or that try to cover it, those are some of the worst ones. I don't think that, like, they haven't earned grace. Um, they don't, like, they don't want, if, like, you don't really want Black people here, you don't want Black people to thrive, like, why should we have grace for you? Hmm. So it definitely I sounds get that I, I get that you know more grace equals peace, right? And I, I wish it could be that way. I wish that you know we could shake a few hands and and you know hold hands and pray and and kumbaya and everything's great. But the reality is there's there's some people that don't want to sit with us. Yeah. So it sounds like you struggle with it. Is is what I'm hearing, which is completely understandable. Uh, or at least I think I understand. And one of the things that I was really excited about when I was sitting down and, and thinking through this series was specifically talking to you because it is clear to me that you have a very clear connection between you and your community. You said we throughout the entirety of this conversation, which is beautiful to hear. But I was really excited because even though there is this really strong connection to your community, it sounds to me like you end up taking over your own reality. And what I mean by that is not just through stories that you've shared, but just being around you and, and, and observing you. It doesn't sound like you default to being a jerk to people or, or seeing somebody not extending grace to you and automatically being the aggressor. I haven't, at least I haven't seen that from you which is really, really, first of all, beautiful to see. Uh, but honestly, it gives me hope, too, because while there, there is the presence of this, this reality that, that's very painful, very hurtful, um, that it is something you can carry with you throughout. Are you aware of that? Or am I just completely off base? No, I think you, I think you nailed it. Um, I, Again, like I said yesterday, I went through a wide range of emotions. I try to get the negative emotions out in the in the in my four walls at home. <laughs> what does that mean? If that means um, you know, if that means having a a call with uh, some of my closest friends, we we just kind of chat and talk about the issues. Whether it means you know talking to Cindy about it, um, whether it means just. Uh, being quiet and just, you know, putting on some music and, and thinking, unpacking things, whatever it means. I, I try to deal with that with inside my four walls of, of my, my home, because um, at the end of the day, like, I, I don't want to be part of the problem. I want to yeah. be 
a part of the solution. And um, but the emotions that I have are very real and 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 are valid and and whatnot. But it doesn't mean that you know we can just walk around and carry. We have to make sure we use the negative energy that is inside of us productively um, to um, strategically try to work through some change um, because you know, just losing your temper or going off on people and, and this, that, and the third, like, it's not really productive energy because you're not going to get anywhere. Um, you don't really get anywhere having um, even civil dialogue with with people that think a certain way this day and age for, for whatever reason. Um, but it's, again, just kind of controlling what I can do and, and, and you know, the limitations that we've had with, with 2020, not being able to really go places and do things and got to wear a mask everywhere, you know, has, has limited, you know, my reach uh, to a certain extent, but whatever I can control, man, I like to, I like to, like I said, I like to influence my friends. I like to influence my family. I like to influence those on my social media page. I like to en enlighten them and, and, you know, kind of, you know, I, I created a hashtag yesterday. Um, this is why, um, because I wanted to, to bring light to like, you know, I, I, I mean, if, if I can only reach one person that thinks differently for them to see, like, I think that's successful, you know, like, this is why Kaepernick took a knee. This is why, you know, we say Black Lives Matter. This is, it, the, you know, those are the things that, you know, again, that's me trying to, you know, you, you know, use my influence for, you know, even if it's only impacting, you know, a few hundred people, at least I, I'm able to get that message out there. Like I said, if one person that, you know, thought on the other way, on the other side of the spectrum, sees just something from that post that they take away, I feel like my job has been done. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I still got to function in society with uh, people that think differently than me, that people that are going to act like they don't think differently than me. And, and like, it's a lot of faking. So I just have to be able to, to, to uh, be a chameleon and, and just kind of go with the flow. Um, but at the same time, stay true to myself. Like I'm, I'm going to be unapologetically black in, in everything that I do. Um, I'm not worried about who it offends or who it doesn't offend because at the end of the day, I know the posture of my heart and the posture of my heart is that I just want equality. I want equality and I want unity and equality and, and unity don't uh, begin until more people get on board and understand what the issues truly are. And you know, I actually engaged in this conversation with um, somebody that's on the other side of the, the spectrum. And uh, she was posting a bunch of stuff that, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, she was posting stuff about um, the fact that the NFL was doing the Black National Anthem uh, before their games uh, this season. And she's like, oh, that's so racist that y'all came up with a national anthem, like, you know, as if it was something that was new. So I just enlightened her that, hey, it's not new. It's something that's, you know, been around for many years. Here's the, here's the, the lyrics to it. I said, um, I hope you understand that the reason that one was created was because the original national anthem that they've sung at every football game for since the beginning of time um, was actually written um, from a, a racist standpoint. I said they actually to the point where they had to get rid of the third stanza because of uh, it talking about slavery. And, you know, and she just started saying, well, just putting black on it just makes it seem like it's just for, and I'm just like, you know what, you're not trying to understand. And um, of course her, you know, people on her page are gonna like all of her comments and not like what I'm saying because, you know, it, it, it helps their narrative or whatever. And I simply told her, I said, listen, I'm not here to argue with you. I say, but I do think that you need to educate yourself um, on the issues that Black America faces. There is a documentary called 13th on Netflix. I'm quite sure you have a Netflix account. If not, borrow one of your family members' passwords. Check this documentary out. It'll explain a lot of, about this. If she watched it, I'm sure she didn't because, but that's all I can do. I can give you resources. I can help you educate yourself, but if you're hell bent on your way being the right way, because I'm open to listening to Trump supporters. I'm open to listening to what they have to say. And, and because I can tell you right now, I'm not a, a Biden guy. I'm not a Trump guy, <laughs> you know? And so I'm, I'm open to, to hearing what you got to say, but at the same time, you can't expect me to just hear what you're saying and accept that as truth because 
not, not everything is true. You need to also be open to the dialogue that I'm bringing to you because there's a lot of truth rooted in what I'm telling you. So I applaud you again. I was really excited when I sat down and thought about this because you were one of the first people that I thought about just because I, I, I've seen these, these things from you, your character, and I applaud you and your, your support system because it, it definitely sounds like you have a good way to go through all these very, very uh, heavy conversations. So I applaud all of you. Good job. And, and you actually, you kind of touched on the last question that I had for you. Um, and that is the idea of having grace in the context of social media. You want to talk about that a couple of, of minutes? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, I think it's tough right now because everything is so divisive and everybody has, again, their narrative and they're going to post whatever they want to post about their narrative. And they're totally against everything else. Like this is my truth. And, and it's fine. I think everybody has to live in their truth. Um, but again, if we, if we want to learn, if we want to grow, if we want true unity, we have to be able to think outside of the box. We have to be able to get information from multiple sources. We can't just, we can't just gravitate to those who look like us because those that look like us are going to share a lot of the same ideals and principles. Um, so, you know, I've had some circumstances on, on social media where it, it was impossible to have grace. You know, I, I had a, a, a racist post on, on my uh, timeline that black lives do not matter. How do I have grace? I can't have grace for that. You know, um, I, now at the same time, you know, I can have grace for some aspects of what came of that situation um, because, you know, a lot of things happened that probably we could have had a little more grace for. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you can't do something that's so malicious and expect grace. I can let people post Trump 2020. I can let people post Biden 2020. I can let, like, all that doesn't, like, that's that's cool. Like, you 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 believe what you believe. You, you do, you support who you want to support. Um, you got some people that are talking about not voting at all. You got people who talk about vote, vote, vote. You got celebrities saying vote, vote, vote now. And it's, that's, it's all, it is what it is. Like I, I, I can respect everybody's uh, freedom of speech, everybody's uh, freedom to believe and, and do whatever they think is best for them and their family. Um, but just don't bring it directly to me. Don't insult me. Don't, um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I don't even want to post my newborn on social media just yet because I still got some people I got to purge through um, on my page because I don't want that racist energy. I don't want somebody, I, I just, I don't know what could happen. I just, it doesn't make me feel good that somebody can write on my timeline, Black Lives Do Not Matter on the same timeline that has a picture of my son. I, I just, that doesn't sit well with me. Um, because if anybody would ever say that my son's life doesn't matter, I'm throwing grace completely out the window. <laughs> I completely understand. Uh, and again, I applaud you because uh, I think you, you touched on a, on a number of really, really good things. You know, one of them being the, the way that we enclose ourselves within our reality, you know, and, and with social media, it, it's already set up in a way where it's curated for us and we don't even realize it and so we are not only oblivious to the other topics or, or opinions out there mm -hmm. but we go further into our own reality and we mm -hmm. fail to realize that and there's so much beauty that happens when you venture outside of of your own reality it, it, but it takes it's, it takes a lot of character a lot of wherewithal awareness and, and really figure out that hey me listening to someone else like you said uh doesn't really change me i can still hold true to myself and and, and what i think is valid uh without you know uh i think really losing grace so 
I applaud you. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time, Jarvis. Uh, if you want to tell us how to find you, I think that would be awesome. I think you've been doing some great things with your conversations, your podcast. Some of the topics that you have are, are amazing, so I, I applaud you for that as well. Where can we find you, Jarvis? Uh, first of all, JarvisSam.com. That's J-A-R-V-I-S-S-A-M.com. That's where you'll find each and every one of the episodes of my podcast. Also, my blog site is there. Um, I do a couple of blog posts uh, here and there that when, as I'm inspired, I have an amazing piece about Kobe Bryant, um, as well as one uh, entitled um, Kaepernick Told Us. And um, yeah, so there you can get me there. Um, Instagram, uh, Jarvis Sam underscore. That's Jarvis Sam underscore on Instagram. And then if you want to connect on Facebook, just look me up, Jarvis Sam on uh, Facebook. Jarvis, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you.